There are two types of people. There are those who know, love, drive and own Teslas. And then there are petrol heads. And then somewhere in between those lines lay the likes of me, the avid car person that shouldn't really like it, but can't help but keep one eye on them to see what they're up to because let's face it, at times, it's been quite fascinating. If you engage with enthusiasts in the automotive community, you'll often hear them describe the Tesla or cars alike as the embodiment of everything that's wrong with these sorts of cars. The things that we know and love about cars, the theater, the drama, the way that they make us feel, the way a V8 sounds, the smoothness of a V6, even the perky fun of a four-cylinder turbocharged engine. Everything that the Tesla is void of, the anti-car if you will. I've been living with this Tesla for the past three days now and this is the latest iteration of the Model 3, the facelift or the upgrade as Tesla like to call it and it's the one that I've chosen in order to try and change yours and my mind about the Tesla. Now this is the part of the video where I will tell you what's new with the upgraded model, what motors it has, what engines it has, what they've done with the gearbox and things like that but Tesla being Tesla here is the new Model 3 with the latest operating software. There are of course some visual changes from the outgoing model. Although it's void from any dramatic styling, the changes are significant. The headlights are thinner and sleeker, but perhaps the bumper at the front is a little too smooth. Reminds me of a certain Ken. The lights at the rear have a little bit more going on and have a wraparound feature. The Tesla T on the boot is now emitted and replaced with the lettering. On the inside, it's business as usual and unmistakably Tesla, or a Scandi living space, minimal, button and clutter free. As the upgraded Model 3 has been out for a number of months now, there probably isn't anything new I could tell you which you don't already know. However, in order to change our minds, other than the normal boxes, an EV must tick, either be refined, be quiet, have good levels of tech, ease of use, all that good stuff, there are three very important things which it must be and I'll explain what they are later on in the video. The one that we're driving today is the rear wheel drive model and it has battery batteries. See, when it was handed over to me, I asked what the capacity of the battery in the Model 3 was and the guy who handed the keys, well, the key card over to me couldn't tell me. Turns out Tesla don't do capacity of batteries, they do range. So 319 miles, and I had a look online and there seems to be a lot of discrepancy between what people claim it has. So to avoid further muddying the water, I'm gonna tell you that it can do up to 319 miles on a full charge. Despite having a 13, 14 degree day, the maximum range so far, the car's indicating is circa 240 miles. So we're 80 odd miles short of its claimed range. The rear wheel drive model can do 0 to 62 mile an hour or 100 kilometers per hour in just 5.8 seconds, which is plenty. Prices for the Model 3 start from circa 40,000 pounds and they can stretch all the way up to just over 60,000 pounds depending on how many of the add-ons you'd like to include. These include some of the enhanced autopilot features, the full self-driving capabilities, a choice of some of the more premium paintwork, and the option of slightly larger alloy wheels. Not to mention some of the benefits that Tesla owners reap, which include things like dog mode, camp mode, arcade in theater, over the air updates, which I'll get into a little bit more later on, the Tesla app, which has some great features, sentry mode, which by the way, I had no idea that you could access a live feed from your phone, voice command, key sharing, and preconditioning. Not to mention you have access to Tesla's global network of 50,000 superchargers. One of the first mistakes I made with Tesla was thinking that you pretty much spec the car at the point of buying it and that's it. To a degree that's true, you pick the colour, the wheels, whether or not you want the towing hitch and of course whether you want rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. But it turns out everything is pretty much pretty wide for all that it can offer, meaning you can buy a base Model 3 a month later, when you're enjoying a glass of red or white liquid courage, you may decide to go on the Tesla app or go on the website and then wake up with a new line on your credit card statement for either 3,400 or 6,800 pounds in the shape of an enhanced autopilot or indeed the full self-driving capabilities. Thanks to the over the air update, I had no idea you could do that. 
I might be late to the game, but this is my first experience with a Tesla. That, coupled with the whole sentry mode thing where you can access the cameras from your phone from afar. And the best part of it is, I parked this last night next to our car and it meant that I could keep tabs on our car as well overnight. Should Tesla launch any new features using the physical technology that's already built into the car, you could have six months, a year, two years down the line. It's like downloading and updating an app on your phone. It's clever that. Just those two features there, where you could download such big features by an over the air update, never seen anything like it. Now, Tesla have decided that one store was too much clutter to have, so moved all the features that we normally found on the stalk over onto the steering wheel, including the indicators. Yes, my hand on a few occasions has looked for a stalk, but after a few hours of driving, you get used to it. And before you start shouting at me in the comments section, if you recall, and if I recall correctly, Ferrari first introduced that on a 458, so we can't be too mad at it. So what else can you do on the steering wheel? So you've got your indicators, you can adjust your volume, skip forward and backwards on your music that you're listening to. I can shine my full beams, I can wash my front windscreen, I can summon the voice assistant, as well as access the 360 camera and adjust all the settings for the cruise control. Now, is all this stuff intuitive? Yes, however, there is a caveat. Like with anything, you have to be prepared to give it time and be patient. If you come out of what I'd like to call a traditional car and expect it to be like duck to water, that may not be the case. You have to give it time, you have to be patient with it, you have to live with it for a, a day or two perhaps, just to sort of climatise to it, and then it becomes very intuitive indeed. I mean, when you think about it, you start using your thumb as opposed to your index or your middle finger to flick the indicator stall. So it's really not as drastic a change as you might think. The same cannot be said for the gearing system, which I'll get into in just a few moments. Dovetailing from that, we must remember that this isn't a traditional car. This is Elon Musk's interpretation of one. I'm still on the fence about the longevity of buttonless cabins. You know, I'm on the motorway at the moment and if I need to go into something, to change something that's buried a couple of steps into a menu, it can be a bit tricky. And the icons aren't, well, they're not exactly big, bulky icons. And if I'm struggling, I like to think about 2020 vision. I don't know. I don't know how others fare. It can be a little bit distracting, is what I'm trying to say. I'll let you make your own mind up about the minimalistic, clutter-free cabin of the Tesla Model 3. And I appreciate why you would like it. It's subjective. But I appreciate this is the way Tesla started. This is the way they remain. And I imagine this is how they'll continue. So let's do a quick fire session of a few likes and a few dislikes. As for the tech, class leading, the comfort levels and the ride is very impressive. And I've been told by an ex Model 3 customer that has significantly improved over the last model. Something that I didn't anticipate liking is the single pedal driving. For those of you who don't know what it is, the accelerator is used to accelerate, but when you take your foot off the accelerator, the car starts to break and it can come to a complete standstill. So once you drive the car for a few days, you very quickly get used to it. And out of all the electric cars that I've driven, most if not all of them have had that feature, but none so better than the one in this car. It's probably the most intuitive and it really works really very well. Sometimes good design goes unnoticed. In all the cars that I've had, whether they were company cars or cars that I've personally owned, the boot lid normally is connected to a mechanism inside the boot, which means that A, you can't fill the boot up all the way to the top because of the mechanism getting in the way, or sometimes the contents of the boot when you're driving around would roll over and hit the mechanism. In the Tesla, the mechanism is built on top, not inside the boot, which means that you can use every inch of boot space that's available to you. Small detail, but well thought out. Well done, Tesla. From its magnetic attachment to its extending range, the over-engineered sun visor deserved a mention. I really enjoyed the screen in the back. My little one was able to enjoy some fossil fuel burning cars driving around in Monaco. 
whilst my partner went garden pot shopping. The Model 3 had ample space in the boot and they all arrived back home in one piece. The dislikes, build quality has come into question on a few occasions. The range is another one. The claim range is a little over 300, 318, 319, but the most I've gotten out of it so far is 248, which represents a shortfall of about 30%, which is a lot. The other thing is the design. I appreciate that it's all about aerodynamics, but the design, just a little bit more adventurous, a bit more dynamic, a bit cooler perhaps. Now, although it's not going to be a massive hindrance because installing and removing a Chelsea is something you're only going to do a handful of times, but because the Isofix anchors were quite embedded into the seat, they were really difficult to get to. The infotainment system is of course a big one, seeing as it makes up every single control in and of the car other than the two buttons on the steering wheel and the pedals. At first glance, it was a little bit overwhelming, but like with anything you spend any length of time in it, it all starts making sense. All the info is fed from a 15.4 inch screen, which works well, is responsive, and there are lots to configure. This of course is a big talking point, as we reviewed the seal a few months ago, a few of you said the infotainment system wasn't very good in the seal, and naturally Tesla came up a few times. Between the two cars, the Tesla probably edges it in overall usability, but the seal did have a lot more physical controls in the center console, which I liked. The important thing to take away, I guess, is that it's very sharp, it's very crisp, and it's very responsive. Everything reacts very quickly to your input. So in terms of overall usability of the interface, no complaints. Now let's move on to the gear changes because this is probably the most controversial part of all of this because it's built into the touchscreen. In case of an emergency, should the screen fail, you do have this control unit up here where you can select the gears, but for your day-to-day, the right side of the screen will be where you change your gears. You swipe down for reverse and you swipe upwards for drive. Now this particular car is running a beta software which has auto shift out of park which basically means that when I get in the car when I put my seatbelt on when I put my foot on the brake it automatically puts me into the right gear. So if I'm parallel parked and there's a car in front of me and I need to reverse, it will just automatically put me into reverse. I was very unsure about how that would work, but as you've probably guessed with the running theme of this video, it's quite intuitive. <laughs> Can't lie, it works. This, I'm led to believe, is where all the hype lays with regards to why you buy a Tesla over any other EV the charging infrastructure. Now I have charging included in the loan for the one week that I have this car, so it should just be a case of plug and play. I've plugged it in and it's charging. 20 minutes remaining. So there's only one thing to do, I guess. It really is plug and play. For those who've experienced using public charge points will appreciate how streamlined this is. Whilst I was charging, I managed to kill some time trying out some of the games in the Tesla Arcade. So overall verdict, do I hate Teslas? If you give one a chance and you try it out and you live with it for a while, it's very difficult to hate Tesla. Having said that, I understand why petrol heads do or would. It goes against the grain of everything that we know and love about cars. The drama, the theater, the character, the feel, all that stuff, yes, is somewhat absent from Tesla and most other EVs actually. Remember earlier in the video I said that other than the normal things that we expect from EVs, it needs to be able to do three things very well. Here's what they are. Number one, it needs to be authentic. Not trying to be something it isn't. Not trying to be liked for all the wrong reasons. We must remember that this isn't a traditional car. This is Elon Musk's interpretation of one. But I appreciate this is the way Tesla started, this is the way they remain, and I imagine this is how they'll continue. Number two, it needs to be fit for purpose. The average owner of a Tesla doesn't just buy into it because of the physical car. It buys into everything that surrounds Tesla as well, the infrastructure, the software, and it's gonna sound a bit of a cliche, but the lifestyle as well. You have access to Tesla's global network of 50,000 superchargers. So it should just be a case 
or plug and play. I've plugged it in and it's charging. The third and final thing is forward thinking. It's got to create its own path with regards to technological advances. Now let's move on to the gear changes because it's built into the touchscreen. Just those two features there where you could download such big features by an over the air update, never seen anything like it. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, found it informative, useful, or at least entertaining. We're over on Instagram as well at the same name, Gox Car Lounge. From next week, we're back to combustion engines. I'm all EV'd out. So I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.